Okay, call the meeting of the Buffs County Board of Commissioners, September 16th, 2020 meeting. I'd like to begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I would ask Judy Reese, our prothonotary, to lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are, take, we are taking public comment um, for the next five minutes on the entire agenda. But before introducing anybody, I did want to add one, make a motion to add something to the agenda, which gives people a chance to provide any feedback they have on it. And that is to add um, the, that the High Information Group, HIG, would begin a contract with the District Attorney's Office from September 16th through December 30th to provide scanning services. Um, is there anything that we want to add to that to better describe it? Um, Commissioner, I believe um, the district attorney's request is uh, to obtain funding for that through the CARES Act. The CARES um, so Act. that would be zero percent to the county. Um, I think the unit cost uh, was listed. Uh, and Mr. Weintraub is here. Will correct me if we have this wrong. 165 per unit. And um, since uh, we're we're still reviewing this, this would be um, if, if approved, pending solicitor approval. Okay. So that is on the agenda. We can talk about that more. I, we'll put it on the regular agenda. That would be item 16, Commissioner. Item 16, there we go. Okay, um, we have a few row offices here. Did you guys want to all introduce yourselves? Got everybody? Okay, thank you. Um, are there any public comments from the public? Are there any comments? There's one, go ahead. Morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Two quick things. I also had a question about an agenda item from last week. Uh, can I ask it now and rather than pop up at the end or shall I wait till the end? You could ask it, but we can't answer yeah. it until the end. Okay. And there you go. Okay. And just um, remind me, though, like wave or something. Oh, I won't let you forget. <laughs> um, on item 7A and E, uh, we're Neither of those programs, work. We, we're, we don't have video cover, video coverage or um, card entrance or the upper or lower box thing. That wasn't planned at all. Okay. Um, and so because of COVID, we, we decided that's to do it. That would be the question for this one. And the other one was... Um, and last week, I think it was item nine under human resources, it mentioned the Rangers um, contract settlement um, for three years. And I was just wondering what the percentage in increase would be during those three years. So thank you. Sure. Okay. For I just to comment on the, the first two, 7A and E, um, well, 7A is focused on um, the problems we had when we had to go virtual in this meeting room, that the audio and video, video systems in this room did not allow us to really successfully, still don't allow us, which is why we have this sort of, you know, the tripod here and, and just the jerry-rigged system of cords and cables um, that we don't really have the ability to connect to the, to the outside world from in here to be able to broadcast in a situation where we had to be socially distant, we couldn't allow anybody in. Um, and so it's really to, up, to upgrade that. Uh, and with the upper and lower box offices, um, because of <clears throat> excuse me, because of the expectation, we're going to get a lot of people coming th to those polls to do to drop off their ballots and also do mail-in voting applications because of again the the, the, the virus pushing more and more people in that direction. Uh, we had to turn them into board of elections offices. Uh, there is no, and there never was any surveillance system in either building, um, which you know I was I found very hard to believe, but you know it was never was never put in to, to either of those buildings, uh, and also we need card access for the security, so we're using the the COVID money to help pay for that, so that people you know don't have to come to the uh, election day. Uh, they could drop things off if they want to their mail-in ballots, et cetera. 
probably would not have done it without the COVID completely. No. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Any other public comment? Is there any um, online? Uh, no, Commissioner. Okay, so seeing none, we can move on to the consent agenda, consent agenda, which includes approving the minutes of the September 2nd meeting. Is there a motion for that? So moved. For second? Second. Any question from the board? All in favor on the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that passes. And that moves us to the regular agenda. First thing we have is number 13, the Board of Elections with Cutco Printing, a division of Single Point Sourcing, LLC, rescinding the contract to provide printing and mailing of election forms from September 1st through November 30th in the amount of $726,688.08. And B, Cutco Printing, a division of uh, Single Point Sourcing. We will approve a contract providing printing and mailing of precinct, mail-in, and absentee ballots for the 2020 general election, September 16th through November 30th, subject to final approval by the solicitor in the amount of $422,076.66. Any questions from the commissioners on that? Did you want to say anything? The um, contract for the mm -hmm. contract for um, the mail-in and in addition to the ballots that go to the precinct um, was bid for the upcoming general election. Um, Cutco um, we awarded at the last commissioner's meeting was the lowest bidder. Um, part of the bid required them to get a performance bond, um, and they are currently working through that process with their attorney and their um, insurance company. However, because um, the Board of Elections took a vote um, that we, the, the employees of the Board of Elections should strive to have ballots out um, beginning September 21st, if at all possible, um, we felt that there is not enough time um, for us to be able to wait for that, their, their um, their internal situation to proceed any further. So we discussed it with them. Um, they understand um, the time constraints we're under. And so we are only awarding them this election and then we are going to go out to bid again probably in January. And they've been told they're welcome to rebid. Um, they are the company that we hired in the primary um, very quickly um, that we did go out and tour them. They are certified by clear ballot and um, they're the company that actually did a great job for us. Um, in the primary, so we're, we're confident in, in their ability to do the work, but it's really a time constraint that we're just too concerned about, and they understand. Okay, questions? Yeah, and just to clarify, I mean, we know obviously we had an issue in the primary with the printing of the ballots. This company didn't do the printing, this company did the mailing. You're correct, Commissioner. Uh, that company's name was Reliance, mm -hmm. um, and the county had worked with them in the past. Um, they were hired um, kind of before <laughs> the law changed and everything started to, to really start to come to a head. Um, we had hired them to print the ballots to go to the precincts, the polling locations. And um, as you may remember, there were news articles about they cut those ballots 1 16th um, too big, too wide, and they did not fit <clears throat> in the um, scanners at the polling places. Um, we had then had a conversation with Clear Ballot, the company that um, manufactures those machines that we use at the polling locations and also here in um, Doylestown for our um, high-speed scanning that we do um, at the end of the night. They cannot retrofit their um, scanners that we send to the polling locations to move the tray that the paper goes in. We requested that. Um, and so moving forward, we need to be able to work with our printer to make sure that they do a lot of quality control ahead of time to make sure that the paper is exactly precise and it will fit into those machines. Um, we've discussed that with Cutco at great length, um, and they seem to understand our concern and will work with us um, to make sure everything we possibly can that that will go more smoothly this time. Right. But they were not they were not the party that caused that issue. Right. Okay. Um, and certainly, this is you know an issue that we have to move on quickly. You know, we we know for the past month and a half, the commissioners and and the county have been getting sort of inundated by phone calls and emails. 
uh, for people wanting to know where their ballots are. There's obviously concern about the Postal Service. There's concern about all kinds of other things. Um, first time we're doing a presidential election using this form of, of voting in Pennsylvania. And so there's a lot of, of anxiety. Um, you know, and Monday would have been the first day we could have mailed ballots if the State Department had, you know, certified them. Uh, there are some legal challenges, which we expect to be solved pretty soon. Uh, so our intention is to mail these out as quickly as we can to people so that if they, if they do get them, you know, within the next few weeks, uh, that there won't be as much anxiety about using the Postal Service. They'll know they'll have plenty of time to, you know, to do what they need to do and get the ballots back here. Uh, and so uh, we definitely need to move on this. We can't, we really can't wait any longer. Okay. Fine. No. okay. Uh, moving on to number 14, um, the commissioner's, commissioner's office, approving the resolution for the tax claim bureau to be overseen by the office of treasurer and to add the title of tax director to the position of the county treasurer. And our treasurer is here. Did you want to take a few moments and explain this? Do you have, I don't, do you have a microphone or wait? Come comes. on your way. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for giving me the responsibility for overseeing that department. And I just want to make clear that as I've been listening to, as we're about to implement a new way of collecting, that one of the largest concerns we have is who this is going to affect and how it will affect Bucks County residents. And I want to make it very clear to the public that we will be dealing with each case with compassion and looking to use every resource available to help people that have fallen on hard times. And while I do have the microphone, I want to just make the public aware that we'll be changing the hours for that department. They're currently open until 5 o'clock, and we'll be making those hours um, 8 a.m. until 4.30. That way, the entire fifth floor where the money sits will be secure at the same time. So thank you again for that, and I look forward to working with the residents on a more personal level. I understand the hardship that people face, and we're looking to bring a level of compassion and awareness and communication there. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. And number 15, this is from the Health Department, approve the change of the Bucks County Title II ADA coordinator from Dr. David Damsker to Virginia Hardwick Esquire. Any questions on that or anything? Um, I mean, just, I guess, probably needs a little bit of explanation of sure. Mr. Khan, if you want to talk a little about that. I'm happy to, Commissioner. Um, so this was a request from the uh, health department to the law department, um, as the um, health department, specifically Dr. Damsker, um, have, has faced unprecedented increases um, in the responsibilities um, dealing um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and also as the opportunities for the county to continue to make sure that we're being as inclusive and, and, and accessible um, to Americans with disabilities um, increase uh, as we uh, have the opportunity to make sure our elections are conducted in a way that provide access um, for people with disabilities. And we are now updating our website to make sure that um, county services are even more accessible uh, and that we do that in a way that, that um, uh, is both uh, accessible and also complies with the law. Um, Ginger Hardwick, who's been working on these issues uh, in the law department, has agreed to take over that uh, title of the ADA coordinator moving forward. Question? Thank you. On that and then we added number 16, which is with, for the high information group at $165 per item, I believe, or per box. Per box. Yes, yeah. um, wait a minute. I'm oh, going to oh, give this to District 56. Attorney Weitruck. So if he would like to just give us a summary of this, and we will correct the. Um, agenda appropriately. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Marseglia. This is, uh, <laughs> it's been a stressful couple of weeks, but uh, the essence of it is we'd like to take advantage of the opportunity that the federal government is giving us to keep people safe from COVID and all types of infectious, highly transmittable diseases. As I'm sure you are aware, and every department probably suffers from the same issue, and that is that uh, all of our files are hard copy files and uh, unfortunately the life of a criminal case is never ending sometimes people bench warrant sometimes people violate the, the, their files or sometimes even they have to be expunged which is a positive thing but a lot of people touch those paper files and uh, what we'd like to try to do is uh, because we were encouraged 
throughout the COVID uh, uh, lockdown, so to speak, that people could work remotely. And if we can digitize those old files, that's less hands on each file. And uh, it certainly streamlines our process. And uh, our goal would be eventually to digitize completely. I know that there were some fits and starts with our, our resolution application here. But I think, I hope, and I pray, and I'm grateful uh, that we have come up with a workaround because I understand that the work needs to be 66% complete, or that's uh, some expert opinion, by the end of this year. So uh, if uh, you were inclined, uh, we, I would be very grateful if you would do it on a piecemeal basis, if you would pass a resolution that allows us to pay HIG $156 per box of material, and then it's on them. The more that they can digitize, the better for all of us but then we're not left hanging out to dry if they don't complete a certain quota amount. So okay. uh, I'm happy to answer any other questions that you might have. But you're changing, so it's not 165, I think that's what we said initially, it's 156. I think it's, it's 156, right? Yeah, that's based on uh, approximately 2,400 images per box, but that can vary slightly. It's six and a half cents per image. Okay. So you can either do six and a half cents estimate. per image or 156 Is that per better? box. We'll make it an estimated cost of 156? Estimated cost of 156 at six and a half cents per image. And and frankly, all pending solicitor's approval. I think they'll be grateful because uh, it's, it's this or nothing. So I, I would ask that you, you do okay. pass that resolution, please. Is there questions for Matt? No. no. Okay. Can, can I also say, and I don't want to preempt this, but uh, I really, I know that this was difficult. Uh, there was a lot of late night uh, wrangling around and, and I'm, I'm very grateful that you've come up with a, what I would view as an elegant workable solution. Uh, this is government at its best to try to come up with solutions that benefit everybody and I'm really appreciative of all of your efforts in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you. Okay. thank you. So do we have a motion to approve the items on the regular agenda 13 through 16? So move. Is there a um, second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to the budget adjustments. Um, we have Mr. Buscol is here for budget adjustment number nine for the Board of Elections, $912,200. Yes, Commissioner. Uh, budget adjustment number nine is for the Board of Elections. This will recognize all of the revenue that uh, the Board of Elections will be receiving for this year. Um, there's a reimbursement for the special election that was held earlier. Um, there's GEMS money. There's um, uh, election security grant money and there's a CARES money that is going directly to the department that there was $912,200 um, and that would recognize the revenue for this year. Um, there is also an opportunity to um, possibly draw down additional GEMS money um, depending on what our actual expenditures are going to be for the year. So we'll be revisiting that um, after the election and when we find out what the, what the actual cost of the election um, and those expenditures are going to be that, that are allowable under the GEMS grant, so. Okay, questions? Okay, all those, uh, I guess, do we have a motion for the budget adjustments? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, personnel actions. Are there any questions on the personnel actions? No. Is there a motion to support the personnel actions of so September moved. 16th? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any board appointments? Yes, Madam Chair, we have um, five appointments to the New Americans Advisory Commission. Um, this will take it up to uh, 13 members. It's uh, capped at 15. Um, so at this time, I'd like to enter into, uh, for, for nomination, uh, Ms. Sue Ann DeVito, Mr. Dermot Kennedy, Ms. Madison Leach, Ms. Vanessa Woods, and uh, Mayor Joe DiGirolamo. Um, Ms. DeVito uh, works for an immigrant rights group, has a lot of experience in that. Um, Ms. Leach is a teacher, uh, teaches uh, English as a second language uh, at a school district here in Bucks County and works with students uh, who, and works with other uh, uh, people who are uh, learning English after having obviously immigrated here. Um, Mr. Kennedy is an immigrant from Ireland who uh, now has a law practice in Bucks County. Ms. Woods uh, represents the Liberian community, uh, is actually a school board member. Um, and uh, Mayor DiGirolamo is himself a, a first generation uh, you know, American, his parents having immigrated from Italy. And there's obviously 
well known to all of us, a little more known to one of us. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll enter into, and all those appointments run uh, concurrent essentially with the term of office of the three of us, so they would end on the 2nd of January, 2024. Question? Mm -hmm. so, yes, to Commissioner Harvey, have we properly vetted that last person? <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's, yeah, it's, it's probably not going to be a unanimous vote on that one. I don't know. <laughs> just, I, I, I just, just a quick comment, and, and I know it was important to him to get on this, and it's my uncle, who everybody, I think most people knows the mayor in Ben Salem, and he's first generation. Um, all four of my grandparents were immigrants to this country, all four from Italy. Three of them came from the same town over in Italy, uh, and I, actually visited there a few years ago and got a book from there. And there's a town, Oscula Picerno, which is a, a beautiful little town of about 50,000 people. And they immigrated here, in, most of them around 1912. And my grandfather, Di Girolamo, did not know my grandmother when they were in the town, but they, they actually met over here and were married around 1920. And to show you what a small world it is. I, I had this book and I actually lent it to Commissioner Harvey uh, to look at because he's got relatives on his side that actually lived in the same town and, and immigrated over here at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And while he was reading the book, he looked at the one of the authors who put it together and the name is Arminia Tosti Luna, and it's actually a relative of Commissioner Harvey, <laughs> who actually helped put this book together. So you're related. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> yeah. We could be. You, so yes, yeah, so I well could. Be. I yeah, you know, I can't vote on on Mayor DiGirolamo. It's our family. <laughs> <laughs> so and I, and I grew up with my grandparents, and I I used to sit around and listen to when they first came over here of all the struggles and the difficulties and, and how hard it was for them. And my grandfather was born in 1897, so he was like 15 years old when he came over all by himself without any relatives. And I often think about that. And I, was, I, I, don't, I don't want my children, sometimes I was afraid to cross the street to go somewhere. And, and there's people that came, and still today they're doing the same thing, coming from across the other side of the world, not knowing how to speak the language, scared to death, probably not knowing where they're going to live or what's going to happen or where they're going to get a job at. And, you know, they, they, they make this country back, back then and even today, they make this country what it is, just a great place for people of all nationalities, of all religions, of all kinds of diversities to be able to live together in harmony and peace. And I, I think that's really important. And uh, I just thought I'd bring us up, Bob, that uh, our, our, uh, our family came from the same town yeah. over in Italy, believe that or not, what a small world. Yeah. So <laughs> thank you, Madam Chairman. That's thank great, you. though. It's a wonderful story, too. Something that we should all remember and live by. Um, you have all the, is that a motion? That's it. Oh, yep. Second. Did you want to second that? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, any other board appointments? No. Are there any other civics? Anyone have any other civics for today? I do not know. I have none. Okay. Chief Operating Officer's Report, Ms. McCabot. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I have a few, few announcements to make. Um, the, P, the Bucks County PA Career Link Services um, have been operating virtually since the beginning of the pandemic. They are now open. They opened Monday, um, but they are continuing to, to provide virtual services as well. Um, their offices are in Bristol Township on Veterans Highway. And their virtual services can be, um, they are located, and you can find them on their website at buckscountycareersolutions.com. We are working with, as you know, we brought the, the Workforce Development Board into county government in July. So our up, we are a little bit behind on updating our website with that information, but it is forthcoming. Uh, we are also hosting our next uh, Household Hazardous Waste event on October 17th at a new location at the Upper Bucks campus of the Community College in Perkasie. 
Uh, it will be held from 9 to 3. Register Pre-registration is required on Eventbrite uh, because we are limited to 500 cars due to DEP's regulations. Um, that link will be available on the county's website shortly as well. The event, the next household hazardous waste event um, following the October 17th event is a two-day event, and that's going to be held at the Newtown campus of the community college on November 21st and the 22nd. So uh, we look forward to continuing that program for our residents, although the CARS uh, limit is uh, 500 people. So get on that website and, and uh, register on Eventbrite when it becomes available. And that's all Thank I you. Have. Any Thank questions? You. Ms. McCavitt? Okay, we'll have a solicitor's report. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, this is a good time to provide the public with an update on some of the election-related litigation that's been going on and, um, and the law department's um, work in that area. Because this is an election year, um, the Secretary of the Commonwealth and her office have been uh, named in numerous election-related lawsuits um, this year, and uh, the county, along with other counties, has been pulled into several of them. Um, a, a number of those cases have been filed in federal court. Um, Pennsylvania has three federal districts, the eastern, the middle, and the western. Um, and we've been sued in all three. Um, uh, w one case in the eastern district concerning how um, ballots are examined, um, one in the middle district concerning the voter registration rolls, and one in the western district concerning um, uh, mostly mail, uh, drop boxes and, and, and things of that nature. Um, and so I'm happy to report that um, one of the approaches we've been able to take this year has been working very collaboratively, just as this, this board has worked very collaboratively with other counties across co the Commonwealth. Um, and, and that specifically has been with the um, five counties in southeastern Pennsylvania, Chester, Montgomery, Philadelphia, um, and Chester and Delaware, along with Bucks, uh, as well as Allegheny out in the west. And um, those cooperative efforts have allowed us to share resources, which have included um, sharing uh, uh, representation. Um, so we've been able to get outstanding representation by the Hangley Aronchek firm, uh, which is, in, in our view, uh, arguably the best firm, the law, uh, best law firm in the country to handle these matters, um, at, at a fraction of what the cost would normally look like because we've been splitting those bills. Um, and so we're, where we are today, the case in the um, Western District um, has essentially been put on hold while the Pennsylvania Supreme Court this week is addressing a lot of these issues concerning how the election will be conducted in November. Um, the case in the Middle District um, has been um, uh, essentially put on hold until after the election uh, for all intents and purposes. Uh, and I'm happy to share that uh, the case filed in the Eastern District um, by the, with the agreement of the plaintiffs who brought it um, was just dismissed against um, the county as well as all of the other defendants. Um, so there's still uh, things to be worked out through um, a case that's pending in the Commonwealth Court. Um, there are still issues, but, but at the moment, uh, we've at least been able to navigate these waters by being very responsible and judicious with the county's resources. Any questions for the solicitor? No, thank you for your work and for the rest of the, yeah. of the staff. Yep. Commissioner, comments? Commissioner Harvey? Sure. Uh, just a couple things. Um, first, you know, we did post, I know yesterday was a post on the uh, Bucks County social media about the, um, or I guess it was in the newspaper yesterday, a post maybe Monday, uh, about the new machine or one of the new machines, the biggest new machine we have, uh, which is a mail sorter uh, that was, uh, you know, sort of cleverly nicknamed the dragon at some point, and now that's basically what it's called. Uh, so it, uh, a very, very large piece of machinery that is going to be critical to helping us go through the process of, of sorting uh, and at some point even opening and, and, you know, dealing with a couple hundred thousand, um, you know, mail-in ballots that are going to come in. Um, at some point, you know, we all knew that there would be a majority, when, you know, when the law passed Act 77 at the end of last year, uh, we all knew that at some point, you know, Bucks County, Pennsylvania would shift so that, you know, a, a good chunk of the population would be voting by mail. We really didn't anticipate it being this much this quickly. Uh, the pandemic clearly had an impact in ramping up the numbers of people uh, who were going to be doing that. Uh, and so uh, the, the necessity of, of purchasing that machine and others became really apparent. And there were some comments I was seeing a little bit on social media about wondering, you know, how you could use CARES money for that. And 
the, the misconception that CARES money was only supposed to be used for, you know, for uh, helping small businesses or for, you know, buying PPE. Uh, the CARES Act allows for the expenditure of any uh, of funds at the county level or state level um, for anything that is attributable to COVID-19, its impact. Uh, and so we have been spending it on a wide variety of things, just obviously PPE. We've been having to pay overtime salaries to people who are working on, uh, on you know, COVID cases, obviously in the health department. We've been using it to purchase um, you know, hand sanitizer for this building. We've used it to purchase, you know, plexiglass shields that have gone in our offices to protect our employees. Uh, we've used it for, uh, you know, a wide variety of things that, you know, we've had to start doing that were never intended to be done, uh, especially not this year, uh, weren't intending to be done, uh, but we've had to, had to make it work. Um, we did spend already 14, a little over $14 million in small business grants. That was done back in uh, June and July. Uh, the second round of grant funding, which is $15 million, uh, is open as we speak. Uh, and so for businesses, 49 employees or smaller uh, that have uh, annual revenue of $2 million or less, uh, take a look at the Bucks County website uh, and the economic resources, and you'll find information about applying to that grant. Um, there is no cap on how much you may get in terms of a business. In the spring, we capped it at $25,000. It can't be more than 25% of your annual revenue, uh, but uh, for certainly for businesses that might make over a million dollars a year, uh, you know, you know, th there, is, there is a higher amount that we may be able to provide depending on how many applications we get. And so I want to uh, publicly thank the people who did a lot of work on this, uh, Jeff Fields and Deanna Giorno. Um, Dana Crawley from the workforce development, uh, you know, side of things, and, and their help in getting all this off the ground. Um, you know, certainly our COO, Marge McKevitt, was was a major part of that as well. So, uh, but that application process is open; it is online. We took some feedback from the spring application process and uh, made some tweaks to this year, this round's application to make it even what we think anyway, even easier and more simplified. Uh, and so, we're hoping to uh, that. The, window closes on Friday, so if you still have some time to apply for that grant, uh, and then our hope is to have checks going out the door sometime early October to help our businesses who, who are still struggling. Um, and also want to talk a little bit about the, um, one of the things that did open, uh, they were closed for a while but are open now, the Bucks County Library System it is open for people. They're doing a lot of, a lot more work than they used to virtually uh, in terms of, of people accessing things from home. Uh, which is great, but the libraries themselves are open. I know there are some libraries that are that are really doing a tremendous amount. Of, some of our libraries doing a lot of work with families uh, who uh, may not have reliable internet access. Their kids are trying to do virtual school, and so they're relying on the libraries uh, to per, to be a place where they can bring their kids uh, so they can actually do the lessons that they're being asked to do by their teachers. So, I uh, encourage you to support the library. You know, they're obviously doing all the things they need to do to keep you safe, keep their employees safe. Uh, and it's, it's a great, uh, and for all, a lot of people who are tired of being trapped in the house uh, and looking for something to do, there's libraries spread all over the county. Uh, and finally, just um, in my mailbox yesterday, I got another four envelopes uh, from an, a, uh, an, uh, an interest group, a well-meaning interest group, uh, sending me uh, mail-in ballot applications. Uh, one for me, my wife, and my two children. Who are both voting age. Uh, I think this is probably the third round, maybe, I think it's the third round of envelopes that I've gotten at my house. And I certainly appreciate and understand their efforts to try and make sure that people are registered and, or, and being able to vote by, by absentee. Um, it's causing con some confusion. I do know that people are assuming that it's coming from the Board of Elections. Uh, that is not the case. Uh, the Board of Elections is not mailing out. The Board of Elections also isn't calling people to tell them. So if you're getting a phone call from anybody that's saying, you know, hey, contact your Board of Elections to register for a mail-in ballot, again, probably a very well-meaning group that wants to try and make sure every vote is, is cast and counted securely. It's not coming from the county. Um, and it is, you know, causing a little bit of, of confusion here for our staff. It's causing confusion for some people who are getting multiple ones of these. I think some people are maybe got the first round of these mailings and sent in their application and it's sitting here, uh, it's being processed and then they get another one in the mail. 
and they think, oh, maybe, maybe I did something wrong, so they fill it out again <laughs> and send it in again. Uh, you know, we do know that we're getting uh, quite a few uh, duplicate applications for mail-in uh, ballots, uh, which are obviously slowing up the process because we have to look at every application. Uh, so we just ask you to, you know, keep in mind, um, you can register online. The applications that I've seen that are sent to me uh, are legitimate. You can use them. You know, it's very helpful. You're, all the personal information is already filled out. All you really have to do is kind of assign it, and uh, it comes in an envelope with the address of this building on it, which is very nice. <laughs> uh, put on a stamp and send it out. That's great. Uh, but you only have to do that once. Uh, you don't have to do it multiple times. So, um, so just wanted to put that piece of information out there, hopefully getting that, uh, that news out to people so that clarifies any confusion. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner DJ Alamo. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I, and because of the upcoming election, I mean, I think that's a, that's a big issue that we're, we're dealing with. And I, I, I first want to just thank everybody at the Board of Elections because they're working really, really hard. Tom and Gail, who's here, and, and, and they know how hard everybody down there is working to make sure this comes off as smoothly and securely as possible. And I want to assure the people in Bucks County that whether they vote by mail or absentee or vote in person, that we're doing everything we can to make sure that your vote counts, that you're safe if you go to the polls and vote, or if you do mail in, that your vote will be counted and it, it will be secure. So I am confident we're gonna do everything we can. Where we could use help is up in Harrisburg, and because I was there when the law was passed back in June of 2019, and when we passed the law, I mean, I, who could have foreseen the coronavirus, as Commissioner Harvey has already said. I mean, uh, so because of this coronavirus, you know, we're expecting at least 200,000 mail-in votes coming in, probably more. And the way the law is writ written is that we cannot start not only bucks, but every county. We cannot start opening those envelopes up or scanning them until election day. And if we got, two, and if we have 200,000 plus ballots, even with the new machines that we have, we are really going to be strained to come up with a reasonable vote count on election night. And that's what everybody's been used to. Everybody's been used to knowing who the winners were where Bucks County were, where the state of Pennsylvania was on election night, and I don't think that's gonna happen if the law stays the same and is not changed. There's a bill up in Harrisburg right now uh, that the House has passed. I think it's over in the Senate. It gives us an additional three days, they call it pre-canvassing, which would give us Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and election day to open the envelopes, scan them, and just to be perfectly clear, the votes would not be counted until the polls close at 8 p.m. on election. So we would not be tabulating the votes and letting them out early. Those votes would not be counted until after election, the polls close on election night. So if we need more time, I mean, I know the governor has talked about 21 days uh, to start doing this. I mean, the more time we had, the better it would be for us. But even if we only had those three extra days, it would really make a big difference in getting that vote counted so that on election night after the polls close, that people here in Bucks County locally will know who won or lost, and that in the state of Pennsylvania, with every counting reporting, we can have a good idea on the national scene who was the winner and who was the loser. So that's, this is not a Republican issue. This is not a Democratic issue. This is something that should be important to everybody, no matter what party you belong to, this idea of pre-canvassing. It is not an advantage for either side. It is just allowing the Board of Elections to do the work that they need to do so that we can have a count on election night. So let's hope they've got a little bit of time left. Let's hope they take it up and come to a compromise and agree on it and get a bill passed and the governor signs it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to both of you for the comments on the election. This is an important time. 
Um, as we open up to pu public comment, I just wanted to, to answer um, Commissioner Warren's question about the Rangers and this has their contract went. It was a three year contract, 2% per year, and a 0.25% contribution back on health care. Is there any other public comment? Go ahead, Mr. Warren. Yes, sir. I don't need to get it. Yes, thank you for that. Two percent a year. At some point in the future, could you, Commissioner Harvey, any of you, Commissioner DiGiro, anybody, Diane, you know, Commissioner uh, Marseglia, could you follow up on just exactly what happens when Andy Warren, not knowing exactly what's going on, um, and gets four well-intended groups sending, sends them into Doylestown. And I fully appreciate what the Board of Elections going through. But could sometime there be assurances that Andy Warren sends in four applications for ballots? They don't just go to four separate people sending out ballots to help. It goes to one spot, and after one, Andy Warren's name is locked out, period. Um, and I, at some point, that would be reassuring. Sure. Yeah, Thank I, you. I can actually answer that now. Uh, it's, it's a fair question, I think, because it is a very, very new um, situation. And I think for a lot of people, you know, it, it's easy for the people who are working on the inside, uh, who, who are sort of seeing the, you know, seeing all the, all the gears moving, uh, that we know what's happening. Uh, but it is, you're right, it's important for everybody else to know. So when you do send in an application, or anybody sends in an application, whether it's online, because you can do it that way too, or on paper, um, if it's coming in on paper, it's time stamped, uh, and they're being reviewed, you know, kind of first in, first out, as much as possible. Uh, if it's a, if everything's filled out fine, there's no issues, no problems, what happens is an employee, whether it's online or on paper, uh, will get that application and will pull up that your information, your voter information, uh, through the state database, which is a secure terminal. It's not connected to the internet. Uh, we need special terminals, actually, devices to allow us to connect to the state database. And we get them from the State Department. Um, all the information is verified that way, name, address, date of birth, et cetera. So your signature shows up. The signature you use when you register to vote shows up on the screen. It can be compared with whatever's in front of the, the poll worker who's, or the worker who's, who's doing the review. Um, if this is the first application you've put in, if everything checks out, you're entered in the state system as someone who is getting a mail-in ballot. If four days later, a completely different employee gets an application from you, as soon as they enter your name, they get a duplicate message pops up on the screen of the state database. Now, what we've been doing is kind of just verifying that you didn't have some realization after you mailed in your first one that or you, may, you thought you made a mistake, uh, or you put the wrong some, something, and you put, you know, you change something, <laughs> uh, you know, the, just to make sure that everything is literally the same. And then once it's a duplicate, once it's confirmed it's a duplicate, it's set aside because you're already in the system. And that would happen, I and mean, we've had people who've sent in literally dozens of applications, and so we have to kind of do that every time. Uh, and I know that I see our chief clerk uh, getting up, so you, you know, want to add something or? I just want to say that the shore system itself is not intuitive, um, and we wish it was because it doesn't say me, Gail Humphrey. If I mark my Gail having one duplicate, it does not tag all my other duplicates I made. Right. So that's if it's already inside. Yeah. If you've yeah. if you've if you've sent in 28, that's the electronic ones. If you've sent in 28 different electronic, you know, applications, and you're already in the system. The shore system doesn't like sort of identify those and like you know just automatically throw them out because they're already identical. We still have to go through all of those online applications too. Uh, so it's yeah, that's the that's that's the slowdown part. So for some people, they were you know panicked, especially early August when all the news about the postal service was in the papers and people were concerned about it. Um, people were entering 
you know, furiously for mail-in ballot applications, and then uh, if it wasn't processed within, you know, a day or two, they were doing it again, uh, and then doing it again, and then doing it again, and that just sort of added to the pile, basically. And then when so. I show up on election day, doubly sure at the poll, the poll watcher knows what they are. Right. So if, yeah, for the, for, if you couldn't hear, because uh, Mr. Warren certainly has a voice, but uh, you know, pretty loud voice, but just in case you couldn't hear on the microphone, because we didn't have a microphone. When you show up on election day, just like with an absentee ballot, it's the same, pretty much the same process. If you had applied for an absentee ballot back, because, and I've been telling people, you know, I, the first half of my elections for the first four years I was able to vote were all absentees because I was at college. And my first vote was by technically mail-in ballot, you know, and that was, you know, a long time ago. Uh, so um, so there was, this is not new, the idea of, of having, of mailing in your ballot. But had I shown up to the polls that day, the poll worker, as I gave my name and they looked in the, in the, in the poll book, would have seen absentee ballot. Uh, and, you know, they, I would have been able to vote provisionally, and that, that would have been sort of held aside until they verified whether or not I had mailed something back. Uh, and that's the process here, too. Is, is you'll be able to vote provisionally. That ballot, those ballots are set aside at the poll uh, until, you know, later that's all rectified as to whether or not, you know, you know, Andy Warren showed up to vote at his poll in Middletown. You know, did he ever send in the application or the bail and ballot he applied for? Yes or no. If you didn't, provisional ballots counted. If you did, because we could register that you, we obviously are not going to know who you voted for, but the fact that it's come in has been registered that provisional ballot to be discarded. I hear you. Hmm? Thank you. Any other public comment? Anything online? Okay. No, 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 no. None? Yeah, okay. okay. Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? second? All in favor? Aye. 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 We will see you October 7th.